Uh, members of the Press Club, thank you for the invitation to come along and speak today. Um, and I was, uh, I had a message from a friend earlier this morning uh, wishing me luck in my new role. And I reflected on the fact in, in my response that uh, the idea of speaking to the Press Club three or four months ago when the invitation was extended was a really good one. And today, in the, my first day in the job, um, I think I prefer to probably be sitting in my office thinking about the enormity of the task that I'm taking on. But I'm here now, so we'll keep going. Uh, today is my first day as the Commissioner of the South Australia Police. And before I talk about my appointment and my vision for SAFOL and the direction that we're going to head in, I'd like to just spend just a, a moment to uh, reflect on our recently retired Commissioner, Gary Burns. Gary had 46 years in policing. 15 years as a member of our executive, three years as a commissioner, and through all of that time and through all of his service as, a, as an operational police officer, he provided outstanding leadership to the organisation, both in terms of his tactical policing capabilities and also as an executive and the, the leader of our organisation. He uh, enjoyed an, ex an exceptional career. He was trusted and respected by his staff, his peers, and within the law enforcement community generally, both here in Australia and overseas. And I think I'm very privileged to be taking over an organisation that's been led so effectively by a person like Gary. I'd also like to welcome Linda Williams on her first day in the role as Deputy Commissioner. Uh, she's taken over from me and um, has been quite a bit of shredding in my office, so you shouldn't have too many skeletons there to deal with. Uh, you can create your own. Uh, welcome aboard and thank you. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, my executive team, the assistant commissioners and directors who have been able to come along today as well. We have new members of our executive group and I'm uh, ably supported by that group in achieving the goals that we are setting for the organisation as we go forward. From a personal perspective, um, I'd just like to reflect on a, a little bit of um, how I managed to get where I am today. In fact, that was a question I asked myself as I stood in front of the mirror this morning with uh, only a small part of my uniform changing, but still a significant change, I, would, I did ask, how is it that Grant Stevens ended up being the Commissioner of the South Australia Police? And if you're here today to find out the answer to that, then you're going to be sadly disappointed because I'm not really sure. Um, I can say, though, that I've, uh, I've had an exceptionally interesting and rewarding career over 33 years. I had no intentions of becoming the Commissioner of Police when I walked out of the Academy gates in late 1983. Uh, my goal was to be a good copper and to enjoy policing and I think it's as a result of that enjoyment that I experienced through every facet of my uh, career that I've been able to continually progress through the ranks to the point where I'm standing here before you today. Uh, as a general patrol officer I experienced all of those things that our police face today still, responding to disturbances, to domestic violence incidents, attending suicides, um, attending road fatalities, um, helping families deal with the, the terrible news of uh, a death in their family, um, riots, policing major events, the whole gamut of policing activities. And it was during this time of, as a general patrol officer that I um, I decided that I would like to join the Star Force. So fully aware of the, uh, the physical training and standards that was required to get in, I dutifully went and bought a pair of GP boots. I put them on and decided I was going to start my training regime in about 1987. So that first day I put the boots on and I went for a run around the block, got home, took them off and decided that the CIB was the career for me. <laughs> which I'm very grateful I made that decision for. So as a member of the CIB, I, uh, I spent uh, quite some time in general CIB in the metropolitan area, uh, working in Elizabeth and at Norwood. And during that time, uh, I had the, uh, the opportunity to investigate complex and serious crimes, including murders, rapes, robberies, uh, illicit drug offences. And it was my interest and passion for illicit drugs as an investigator that saw me uh, transition into the Drug Task Force. Um, and I have to say that I reflect on my career and I remember the Drug Task Force as some of those uh, most interesting and enjoyable times. Uh, great teamwork, uh, great camaraderie, uh, a huge work ethic and a group of people who knew how to enjoy themselves once the job was done. And uh, it was my willingness or my, my natural ability to investigate those sorts of crimes and the, the, the desire to be pa participating in that team environment that I think contributed to me being seen as a successful investigator. 
However, I never held myself out to be one of the best detectives. And I look, I look around the room in the Drug Task Force office or in my local CIB office, and I saw people who I regarded as exceptional detectives. And they were the sort of people that you wouldn't want chasing you if, uh, if you'd done something wrong. I think I was competent and certainly capable, uh, but I saw others as being far more uh, attuned to the role of a detective than I was. And it was probably those thoughts that led me to pursuing other dimensions in policing. Uh, and I moved briefly into a training environment where I trained people in relation to criminal investigations, particularly around illicit drugs, because it was still my passion. Uh, and then I moved into the management side of things, which uh, I found hugely rewarding and very engaging. As an officer of police, uh, as um, Jeremy pointed out, um, probably the most significant and memorable time in my career and one that I would attribute to having a major factor in me standing here today as the Commissioner of Police was my time with the Pedophile Task Force. This job came about as a result of uh, a, sh a phone call from the then Assistant Commissioner of Crime, Madeleine Glynn, asking if I was available for a two to three month stint to uh, investigate some allegations about historical sexual offending within the Anglican Church. Um, I had an absolute disinterest in child sexual offences. I found them very difficult to investigate. I, uh, I think it was because I empathised with the victims. Uh, I, I just, it was not a pleasant experience for me to investigate these. So I put that aside and I said yes. Um, I've always had the philosophy that saying yes is the best answer when you're asked to do something. And I took it on. Well, the two to three month task uh, rolled out into probably the most significant and longest running a criminal investigation task force that's been conducted in South Australia. It ran for a total of seven years with dozens and dozens of arrests for historical child sexual offences. Uh, we gave opportunities to people my age and older for closure in relation to serious crimes which were committed against them when they were children and it was something I was immensely proud of. And I was talking to Mal Hyde uh, at a function, a Christmas function, um, sometime after the task force had started and we'd started to get results. And he said, how's it going? And I said, well, it's like going okay. You know, we're doing what you need us to do. And he said, well, I don't think you realise the significance of the role you're playing and the impact it's going to have on the rest of your career. And I have to be honest, at that time, I didn't realise that significant. And it's only on reflection I realised how important that was in terms of my development as a manager and a police leader. So I, I moved on from sexual crimes, uh, sorry, from the pedophile task force into developing and establishing the sexual crimes investigation branch in South Australia. Uh, a function that didn't exist prior to that time and once again played an important role in making sure that victims of serious crimes uh, had a voice and that we had the capacity within our organisation to effectively investigate those crimes. Another thing that I was very proud of and I think, I think also another factor in developing me in, in terms of my capacity to, to go further in the organisation. As a result of those things and uh, I think obviously timing and circumstance I was lucky enough to become a, uh, uh, an, uh, an assistant commissioner and I had the portfolios of road safety, human resources and uh, serious crime. Road safety was a, a turning point for me. It was a field of policing I'd never been involved in other than as a general duties police officer. But I developed a, a, an intense understanding for the impact that uh, the policing has on road safety and had the opportunity and privilege to uh, assist in the construction of South Australia's police's first road safety strategy which has been the template for our strategy going forward since 2006 up until today. And it's a strategy that continues to be relevant. It also gave me an opportunity to be involved in some key initiatives around road safety, including the introduction of uh, driver drug testing, uh, traffic watch complaint system, online traffic intelligence, and a range of other initiatives which today still exist and give us the capacity to provide the best service to the community of South Australia in terms of keeping our roads safe. Another important factor was my time in crime service. Um, it was uh, at that point in my career where I became heavily involved in the role of South Australia Police in targeting outlaw motorcycle gangs. Um, we developed a, a, our OMCG management plan, which made sure that there was a whole of organisation focus on disrupting and dismantling the illicit activities of outlaw motorcycle gangs. And it was that role that saw us continue to hold the reputation as uh, leaders in the field of outlaw motorcycle gang policing, something that South Australia Police is very proud of and something we're seen as by our peers in other jurisdictions as leaders in. 
So uh, I, I was very fortunate in my time as an Assistant Commissioner, uh, not to understate the role I played in HR. It was only a brief period, but it gave me an insight into the, uh, the administrative side of the organisation, which I think has also contributed to my selection as the Deputy and, and now as the Commissioner of Police. So that's a snapshot of my, my personal experience, I suppose, and, and the, uh, the path I've followed to go from that constable that walked out of the Police Academy gates in 1983 to the 21st of July 2015 when I stand here as the Commissioner of Police. We have some challenges ahead and part of those challenges are being addressed by the reform program that South Australia Police commenced a couple of years ago. I'm the co-architect of the reform program and I'm the director of the program uh, that was instigated under Commissioner Gary Burns and this program is re-examining the, the policing model that we have in South Australia and making decisions about which is the best way for us to go forward into the future to ensure that we can continue to deliver the services that the South Australian community has come to expect of SAPOL. This is the biggest review that's been undertaken in the history of SAPOL for the last 20 years. Uh, we had a, a major reform program when Commissioner Mal Hyde came on board called Focus 21 and that set the course for how the organisation was going to run for this period up until now. But any sensible uh, business is going to examine how they operate and this is what we're doing today. Uh, I, I wouldn't imagine there's a private sector organisation that operates today with the same business model as they had 15 to 17 years ago. So it's our obligation and our responsibility to critically examine how we provide services to the community and make the changes that we need to so that we are adaptive, we're innovative and responsive to those needs. This gives us the capacity as well on this analysis to identify what our priorities are and where our resources should be to address those priorities. So we are going to see change in South Australian Police and we're going to see those changes rolling out from today onwards and I'm expecting that we'll have significant changes to the structure of our policing model by the end of this year. What this effectively means is, in the broadest sense, is we are reducing our policing model from six local service areas to three. We're going to have more uh, defined management structures and we're going to have greater capacity to ensure that we maintain our response times to calls for assistance, those high level grade one calls for assistance, and that we have sufficient police resources working within the community to identify the causes of the issues that uh, result in police attendance, community policing at its core. This is our focus and this is what we're going to deliver and commence the rollout of this before the end of this year. It means that the borders that we currently feel constrained by will, will disappear in our new policing model. We're going to use technology to ensure that we can send the most appropriate and closest car to a call for assistance and no longer feel constrained by the fact that uh, there's this imaginary dividing line between one local service area and another. These dividing lines were necessary in past times because we didn't have the, the technology or the communications available to us that allowed us to make best use of our resources. Now with that recognition that we can do that, it's time to actually look at how we restructure and that's what we're doing. So there are significant changes on the way and we're very excited about the opportunity that it provides us. We're also looking at the, the services and the way we provide those services. For example, um, traffic policing, road safety. Uh, we've recently released papers that uh, uh, explain the direction we're heading in. We're taking our traffic policing resources out of the local service areas and we're pulling them into a specialist area under the command of one traffic commander. Our expectation is that we will be able to more effectively put our traffic policing resources where they're needed so we can contribute even more to the reduction in serious injury crashes and fatality crashes. Something else we're very excited about. We're also looking at crime scene investigations, making sure that our specialist crime scene investigators uh, are able to deploy and share the workload across the entire metropolitan area. And the family and domestic violence uh, branches are also under examination in terms of making sure we have the right staffing mix and that we have the right number of resources structured in the right way to deliver those services that the community expect. This is not about budget. And I know there are people out there who like to uh, throw to that line and uh, make the, uh, the, the leap that SAPOL is reforming or restructuring because of budget cuts. This is about good business sense and it's about making sure that the model we have in place is capable of delivering the, the services that the community of South Australia has come to expect of the South Australia Police. 
That's not to say that we don't think about budget and, and meeting our budget obligations as we go forward, but the purpose and intent of this reform program is to ensure that we can provide those services in a timely and responsive way. And the other part of making sure that we can provide those services is making sure that we have a clear and uh, well understood vision for the organisation going forward. And on your tables uh, you'll see a document called SAPOL 2020 which is being launched today and this is our new strategic vision. We've put a lot of energy into the last uh, couple of months in developing our, our new direction and I need to say from the outset, whilst it's a new direction, it's not a, it's not a completely different direction to where we've been heading for the last three years under Gary Burns. This is a consolidation of the efforts that we put in over the last three years and resetting that direction and reaffirming the fact that we're on the right track. Making sure that uh, the, the vision of a visible and responsive police service for South Australia is articulated, that all of our workforce understand it and all are capable of working towards that particular goal. Within that vision, you'll see that there's a strong emphasis on individual professionalism and leadership. This is a non-negotiable for our staff, whether they're sworn members or civilians. Every single member of SAPOL is required to provide uh, a professional and committed service to the organisation. It's, it would be wrong of us to expect any less. There's also an emphasis on accountability. People need to be accountable for the services they provide because the organisation is accountable to the community, therefore we have that right to expect that our people will maintain that obligation. Engagement is also an important factor in this new uh, strategic vision. We've only been successful as a policing organisation and we only are held in the regard that we are held in within the community of South Australia because we make the effort to engage with the community and find out exactly what the community feels and thinks about crime and policing. And we're going to continue with that commitment to engagement because that commitment enables us to understand our community. And sometimes it's not about providing every service the community thinks it needs from the, the police, it's about educating the community as well as to what the police function is and how we can best suit their or service their needs without actually being all things for all people. If we can achieve these then public confidence will be maintained when we've enjoyed, as I've said, an exceptionally high level of public confidence and trust within South Australia and it's my, my goal to maintain that level of confidence that we enjoy within the South Australian community. We are a respected police service and it's my obligation to maintain that level of respect. So that's what we're going to deliver going forward. And as I say, there is no hiding from the fact that we do have fiscal responsibilities and it's our intention to operate the police service within budget and meet the budget savings targets that are placed against us as they have been placed against every government organisation. With a new vision in place, it's important to say that some of our priorities will not change and I think Jeremy mentioned some of those in his introduction. In fact, if I crossed out everything you mentioned, Jeremy, I, I could just take questions straight away. It's all right. <laughs> One of the first things that uh, we'll continue to maintain an emphasis on is domestic violence and the policing response to domestic violence. Back in uh, 2012, uh, we came under significant criticism as a result of our response to the death of Zara Abrahamzadeh. In fact, it was the lack of police response in the lead up to her death that was the subject of that criticism. Now, we uh, had the capacity to conduct a review of our own prior to the coroner's inquest into Zara's death, and we found significant shortfalls in the level of service that we provided to Zara and her family. 42 recommendations were made as a result of an internal review, and the coroner made a further 10 recommendations as a result of his inquest. Now, we embraced those changes, and we commenced implementation of them immediately, and Whilst we had reasonably good policies and we had reasonably good processes and practices and we had a, a generally good level of commitment from our workforce in terms of responding to domestic violence, we didn't have a seamless approach. We didn't have perfect policies and we didn't have fantastic systems to ensure that the risk of someone falling through the cracks and not receiving the level of service they were entitled to uh, was diminished. So these changes have resulted in a significant shift in culture within the organisation. I'd happily put my hand on my heart and say there's not one single member of the South Australia Police who doesn't understand the importance of domestic violence and the policing response to it. And that's what we're seeking to achieve. I think that message has also spread beyond the South Australia Police and its workforce to the community of South Australia. It's my sense that there is a 
higher level of confidence within the community and there's also a higher level of confidence within the domestic service agencies that SAPOL is capable of attending to the needs of victims of domestic violence and responding in the appropriate and timely way. This capability and this trust or confidence that the community has in us to respond to domestic violence is reflected in what we're seeing in the recent crime statistics. Normally a police commissioner would be uh, troubled and concerned about an increase in uh, domestic violence related assaults going up to up by 14 per cent. But we're seeing it in a different way. We're seeing this as a, an endorsement by the community that South Australia Police is capable of managing those particular complaints and there is a, a level of confidence that people have to come forward and report issues of domestic violence. The other thing it shows us is that our workforce has a different attitude towards domestic violence as well and jobs that they might have ordinarily attended as a, a normal disturbance where they've gone along, resolved the situation, got back in the patrol car and gone on to the next job are now being more closely examined and they're identifying issues of domestic violence and family violence and they're responding appropriately. We're seeing an increase in reporting which, as I say, may be seen as concerning but we see it as a very positive sign that there's a shifting culture within the organisation and one that we aim to maintain. Over the last couple of years we've also worked uh, diligently to establish the Multi-Agency Protection Service, an initiative that was brought back from the UK by Commissioner Gary Burns, uh, proposed to all of the government agencies that have a role in responding and assisting mem uh, to victims of domestic violence. And we've seen what is highly regarded as the most effective uh, multi-agency approach in Australia operating here within South Australia. Uh, something we're extremely proud of. We are leaders in this particular field, both within the South Australian Government and also across the, the rest of Australia. We have people coming to South Australia to have a look at how we're running the multi-agency protection service. This service is providing another layer of risk uh, mitigation for people who are the victims of domestic violence. If any particular agency uh, hasn't properly responded. The multi-agency protection service gives us another opportunity to identify that failure and to put corrective measures in place as quickly as possible so that that failure doesn't result in further harm to the victims of domestic violence. The other thing it does is provides us opportunities to identify issues of domestic violence. Historically, uh, the police might go along to an incident um, and it might only be the police report that gives us some idea that a family is the subject of violence. But if we're working with education and health and housing and uh, corrections and everybody's sitting around the same table talking about their holdings on these particular issues, we get a much clearer picture of what's, what a family is experiencing. So a child who turns up to school repeatedly without lunch or uh, re reports to uh, an emergency ward with bruising or fractures, when you add that information into the fact that uh, Housing SA haven't been able to get into a house because of the terrible conditions, we start to get a much clearer picture of what a family might be going through so we can tailor the response to suit that family. I think the multi-agency protection service is going to be a feature of the South Australian landscape for some time to come and we are going to continue to have people coming here to have a look at how we're attending to the issue of domestic violence. That's something South Australia should be proud of. We still have more to do though. We have currently a review underway in relation to our resources committed to domestic violence in South Australia Police. And I fully expect, as we move forward with our uh, restructuring and our review, that we are going to dedicate more operational police resources and intelligence analysis to the issue of domestic violence. We're going to put the right number of skilled people in to ensure that we can deal with that increased level of confidence that we see within the South Australian community to report matters to the South Australia Police. And once again ensure that there is a seamless approach in how we respond to domestic violence. So that's on the horizon. Another priority that's not going to change is our commitment to tackling and dismantling organised crime, particularly the public face of organised crime, which is outlaw motorcycle gangs. Now, it's not too often that the issue of outlaw motorcycle gangs isn't a feature in our news media, whether it be on the paper or on TV. We're always hearing and seeing issues regarding outlaw motorcycle gangs. We have a substantial portfolio of evidence that shows that outlaw motorcycle gangs are responsible for a significant negative impact on public safety. We know they are involved, involved in serious organised crime, including drug trafficking, extortions, blackmails, uh, you name it, they've got their finger in the illicit pie. Our 
continued efforts to disrupt and dismantle OMCGs will not change under my time as the Commissioner of South Australia Police. We've put a lot of energy over the last 15 to 20 years in making sure that outlaw motorcycle gangs in South Australia know their place. And within the current constraints of the legislation we have to operate, we are doing as much as we can to keep them under a, a tight control. There's always further opportunities. We've had some excellent legislation uh, provided to us which have given us the capacity to, to push them even harder. But our endeavour is to make sure that we can actually prevent them from committing crime rather than just respond to the crimes they commit. That will be a continuing feature of how we provide services to South Australia. Obviously, uh, as I said, outlaw motorcycle gangs are involved in the distribution and manufacture of illicit substances, particularly methamphetamine. And there's no secret in the room or within the community that the issue of ice is one that is confronting our community and others around Australia. We're no different to anywhere else. That doesn't mean that it's OK. Ice is seen as a scourge on our society and we can directly attribute its presence in our community to those people who manufacture and distribute it, and that is outlaw motorcycle gangs. We're always finding that they are one step ahead of us in terms of how they source precursors and how they distribute their illicit substances uh, throughout South Australia and other parts of Australia. ICE has a significant impact on our community. It impacts on people's mental health. It has a significant impact on crime. People commit crime it's to facilitate their drug habits. It has an impact on road safety. Now, none of us are safe while we have people using illicit substances and using our road network. And of course there's the economic impact in dealing with people who fall out of society because they are addicted to uh, such a substance. So the issue of ICE is not just a law enforcement problem, it's much wider than that. It's about health, it's about education, but it is also about police enforcement and that's where we play a significant role. And once again it comes back to organised crime. The best impact we can have is to target the distribution networks and the manufacturing and that's what we're going to continue doing. The other aspect to this is, of course, it's a community problem. It's not just an education, health or police problem, it's a community problem. People within the community have information and they have a capacity to provide assistance to us and that's what we're expecting from the community as well. There has to be a, a whole of community ownership to this particular issue if we're going to see any changes in the impact it has on our society. Another aspect that we're going to continue as a priority is road safety. It's going to be a continued commitment, one that we've had in place for several years. And we have a significantly high level of compliance with our road rules within our community. But on the same token, we see time and time again people who make stupid decisions or have a disregard for some of the simple road rules which contribute substantially to their risk of being involved in a serious injury, collision or a fatality. It's no secret that uh, distraction is a big issue for us in South Australia. You only have to drive down the street and you can see people, if they think they're not being observed, talking on their mobile phones and you see even more crazy things with people eating cereal, reading papers, all, all sorts of stupid behaviours. So we're going to maintain a focus on that. We're going to maintain a focus on drug and drink driving. We have the best drug driving framework in South Australia compared to anywhere else in the world. We are seen as leaders in this field and we're going to maintain that that mantle. We intend to continue ensuring that South Australian roads are as safe as they possibly can be. Some of the statistics we see coming out of our drink driving statistics are very troubling. One in 11 drivers that are stopped by our drug testing team prove, uh, test positive for illicit substances and over half of those are for methamphetamine substances, linking back once again to the issue of illicit drugs, OMCGs and road safety. In addition to our existing priorities, we have new challenges and new opportunities as well. As we go forward, I intend to put a focus on technology as an enabler for our police to target crime. That's the positive side of it. It gives us tools that enable us to be more effective in identifying and responding to crime, but there is a negative aspect as well. The negative aspect is that criminals also use technology as an enabler to facilitate their illegal activities. We've seen a, a, the growing trend of a borderless global community where people can commit crimes in one jurisdiction whilst they're sitting thousands and thousands of miles away, making it very difficult for enforcement to identify the offenders and take action. It also creates an opportunity for offenders to collaborate and share information and 
and participate in illegal crime. The, uh, the issue of the dark net is one that we're struggling with. Uh, drug distribution over the internet uh, causes us significant issues and concerns as a law enforcement agency. To respond to this effectively, we need to have uh, the capacity from a technology point of view that equals those taken advantage of by criminals. We also need to be able to collaborate with our partners, both in Australia and overseas, to make sure that we have the capacity to respond when the people who are committing crimes over the internet, over, over using technology, can be identified and targeted. From a policing point of view, we've already taken great steps towards making sure that technology is a feature of how we do business. Uh, there's been plenty of discussion in the media about body-worn video, with police officers wearing cameras. And we're working towards that at this point in time. We're giving our police officers uh, mobile computing capacity through uh, data entry terminals and ruggedised laptops. We're introducing training simulators which is going to enhance their capacity and professionalism through driving simulation and firearm simulation and reducing the risk to our officers while they undertake that training. We've introduced fingerprint scanners which give us real-time information on the identity of people and we've also got automated number plate recognition out and about on our roads today. These are important tools that enable us to track information, criminals and detect crime. I mentioned before about the, uh, uh, the borderless nature of our uh, local service areas going forward and one important part in achieving that is automated vehicle location. All of our patrol cars will be able to be identified and pinpointed so we can send the closest, most appropriate car when we have a call for assistance. We're giving our patrols smartphones so they can access information whilst they're out of their vehicle and away from the car. We have a major reform program for our technology uh, platform called SHIELD. SHIELD is uh, a substantial prisoner management system, a reporting system and an intelligence system that's being introduced into SAPOL. And this, will, this is a generational shift in terms of how we manage information with the organisation. And this is well on the way and we're going to continue down that path. We're also looking at online crime reporting, making it easier for people to connect with police, provide information, report crime and have it responded to in a timely way. It's, uh, it's commonplace now. Nobody goes to the local bank anymore. You do all of your banking online and there are some aspects of a policing service that can be provided the same way. It's more efficient, it's easier to access and it's what people want, so we're walking, working towards that. Another aspect that is falling out of our major reform program is the use of predictive policing technology. As a part of our new model that we're developing, we're looking at a state command centre which will centrally manage all calls for assistance and the deployment of patrols. An important part of that is going to be using uh, analytical tools that give us the best information about where our patrols should be and we're developing that at this point in time and we're hopeful that we'll be able to introduce that as part of our new model going forward. Technology lends itself to another opportunity as well and that is to examine workforce mix within a police department. At the moment, the focus is on police officers and more police and, and frontline services. The reality is that as we move down a technology path and we become more uh, adept at identifying the best way to do business, that it might not necessarily be a police officer that we're looking for. Uh, police will always have an important role, but our objective is to make sure that we have police officers exercising their authorities, exercising their, their warrant of the office of constable as opposed to sitting in a back office somewhere undertaking duties that could be undertaken by someone who is more qualified or suited to that particular back office function. So we're now having a look at our organisation and we're seeing where the opportunities are to take police officers out of those back office areas and put them on the front line. And when I say front line, I mean patrols, I mean traffic policing, I mean detectives, our star group, our water response, our dog squad, all of those people who provide a direct policing service to the community. That's my focus, is to make sure police officers are doing frontline police work. So civilianisation is something that uh, will be part of the conversation going forward, making sure that we get police officers doing the best they can and providing the safest community possible. Another very important feature of the, the future landscape, in fact it's here with us now, is terrorism. This is a challenging time for South Australia. It's a, a challenging time for Australia. Over the last couple of years, we've seen more than a dozen incidents globally where uh, radicals have taken action or attempted to commit terrorist incidents, both in Australia and overseas, which cut to the core of our feeling of safety as a community. 
Our role within South Australia Police is to make sure that we are as prepared as we possibly can be to respond to these issues of terrorism and at the same time ensure that people within our community feel safe and have the confidence to go about their daily lives without being impacted by the threat of terrorism. This is going to become more and more challenging as we see more incidents and the reality is that we're not looking at the 9-11 type disaster anymore where we see you know, thousands of people uh, being killed in one incident. We're talking about one or two people being the target of a terrorist act and that one or two person act has the same impact on our community as the, the major incident. So the challenge for us as a policing organisation is to ensure that people feel safe in our community, that we have the capacity to prevent those incidents from happening as much as is possible, but to also respond and deal with those when they do occur. So that's something that we really need to continue our focus on and it's going to be a feature of how we um, restructure our organisation to make sure we have that capacity. We've already put more resources into the field that examines uh, terrorism and our, our response and I would imagine that it's something that we're going to have to maintain that ongoing focus on for some time to come. With the alert level being uh, elevated from medium to high uh, earlier this year, uh, we saw a change in the landscape. That, that change is with us for years to come. The, the likelihood of it being reduced in the current environment is, is very low, so our, uh, our level of focus needs to be uh, complementary to the, the, the level that we're currently at. And if, we, uh, if we're able to provide that sense of safety, if, if people feel safe within our community, then I think we, we're a long way towards actually um, proactively responding to terrorism and, and maintaining the standard of life and, and the social environment that we're all used to enjoying. So there's some of the things that I think we're going to be focusing on going forward. And can I say in closing that uh, this is uh, somewhat a humbling opportunity to be selected as uh, the 22nd Police Commissioner for South Australia. As I said before, as I, as I started out in my presentation, it's not something I um, uh, set out to become when I, I left the Police Academy. In fact, probably 10 years ago, I didn't give much thought to the opportunity about being Commissioner. But now that I'm here, now that I'm uh, accepting the role, um, I'm, I'm very positive about the future. I'm very fortunate to be taking over an organisation which is well established, well run, and providing uh, a highly regarded service to the community of South Australia. And I'm, I'm more than ready to take on that obligation to maintain that level of service and to continue and improve the South Australia Police so it can be and maintain that high level of regard that it has in the community. Thank you for your time.